thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time. So first, I wanted to let everybody know that we will be sticking to our 1030 to 1130 time frame, And we have our three panelists will be giving a few opening remarks and then we'll roll into Q&A. Um, hello, my name is Katie O'Brien and I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing at the Admiral at the Lake. I joined the team about a year and a half ago and um, it's, uh, it's just been a pleasure. And I love um, working with the residents and the team here and hopefully we'll have a chance to meet those of you that are here that you'll stop in for a tour or come one time to see the Admiral and to meet some of the residents. Um, okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. There is, um, as I mentioned, a Q&A, so feel free to um, use the chat feature and send questions if you like. And we also had a few that were submitted ahead of time, and we'll be getting to those as well. If for some reason we don't get to your specific question, uh, we will um, follow up with you individually uh, after the time together, after the event. Hi, Dr. Mizuno, thanks for joining no, us. Sorry, I did a No, sorry about the tech. tech. There's, always, there's always one or two technical pieces we have to take care of when we get started. So first I'd like to introduce Nadia Geigler, our CEO of the Admiral at the Lake. Um, I'm, it's, been wonderful to work with under her and uh, with her leadership. She has a culture of inclusivity and transparency, and it's just been great to learn from her and be part of her team. So Nadia, can you share some of your thoughts with the people with who with our participants today? Sure, Katie, I will. Thank you so much. Um, I, I wish I could see your faces. I mean, I see Katie Minna, Dr. Mizuno and myself, um, I know what they look like and I wish I could have a chance to feel like I'm in the same room with you all. So I'd echo Katie's comments about coming for a tour if you're interested. We'd love to meet you face to face. I also wanted to let you know that Katie's pretty sly. That comment about sticking to the 10.30 to 11.30 was for me. And I told her this morning I was worried that I'd get too wordy, um, especially when I get talking about the Admiral. So set a timer for myself and I'm gonna stick to it. But very happy to answer any questions that come up. So, um, so my name, Nadia Geigler. I've worked here at the Admiral since April of 2016. So next month, I'll celebrate five years officially. It is the best place I've ever had the privilege of working. And um, culture is a big part of that. You might hear some of that from me in this um, opening comment part, but you'll hear it probably later with the questions that come up. So Katie asked us to think about something interesting to share with ourselves. Uh, I had to clarify, that was the only thing I clarified with her, I think was interesting, like personal or interesting professional. And so I think personal, so here it goes. I have three for you. Um, last summer, I started getting into gardening and I needed to build a planter box out of wood. I'd never built anything before. And so I did that and accidentally slipped into a hobby of woodworking. And so now I have tools and I build furniture and restore things. And I'm um, always looking for a project. So if you need something built, let me know. Um, the second thing that might be interesting to know is that I was valedictorian of my kindergarten class. <laughs> and um, I was also valedictorian when I graduated from graduate school. And then in between was several years of mediocrity. Um, I was nobody's valedictorian anywhere in between. And then the third thing was just to mention that I'm taking piano lessons. And the thing I like about that hobby is um, I've had to humble myself quite a bit. I'm learning from my youngest sister who's in her late twenties and I'm taking lessons alongside my oldest child. I have two girls and my oldest is eight. And so I'm humbling myself before my youngest sister and my kids um, and trying to learn uh, major skills, working my way through all the majors and then eventually the minors. So that's a little bit about me. My experience with the Admiral. So I toured this place for the first time in May of 2015. I was happily employed at a large system of not-for-profit aging services providers that has a nationwide footprint. 
It was the only other place I'd worked before coming to the Admiral. I grew up there in every sense of the word, personally and professionally. I had a lot of close contacts and friends there. Um, I really was being coached and nurtured all the time in that organization. So very happy, but I came and toured the Admiral um, and, and was really just interested in getting a sense for what all the hype was about. Um, very pretty place, good views, but what really, really impressed me when I came on that tour were the real relationships and connections that I could see even as a stranger coming in off the street. And those connections were visible in every combination of resident and staff. Um, I was touring with uh, a, a person who was in a director level position. And so, um, and so that was important just because as I, he came across other people, the sense of equality and um, accessibility, approachability of one to the other, regardless of who they were, just really, really stood out to me. And so here I'd gone from being happily employed elsewhere to being unable to stop thinking about the Admiral. And as luck would have it for me, at least um, a couple months later, they reached out. Um, the folks in leadership at the time were looking to add a COO to the organization and they wondered if I was interested and I couldn't say yes fast enough. So that's how I came to join the Admiral at the Lake. Um, another plug for a tour or a visit sometime if you're willing, this is the kind of stuff that you either have to take at face value from me um, and we're probably meeting each other for the first time or you can come through the front door and see it for yourself. And I think if you came for a tour or a lunch or be our guest today, my guess is you would get that same sense um, that I had back in May of 2015. So I've been in the field since 1999. I was with my previous employer. Um, I worked in the corporate office. Then I went out to several different communities like the Admiral Standalone CCRCs, and then back to the corporate office. Somewhere in there, I was, um, was also starting up a home health and home care agency for the organization. A licensed nursing home administrator in Illinois and Minnesota. Got my master's while I was there. I did quite a bit. None of that really matters, I think, except I would just say that all of those experience, all those experiences together, along with a fellowship I went through um, with our National Association Leading Age uh, Fellowship I went through on leadership development, all together helped me realize that something that's very important to me is to connect people and share idea, ideas so that we can grow sustainable relationships of trust and belonging. And that's something that I've been able to do and experience here and benefit from. So highlights from the last year, there's a lot we could talk about. I think the, the headline of that point is that the Admiral at the Lake, um, for better, or for worse, never felt like we were surviving anything. It's true that the last year came with a lot of uncertainty and certainly was unprecedented in its own right. We acknowledged and saw that there were moments of um, fear or wonder about what a present situation would look like or something in the future. But for the most part, the stance of this community wasn't in the mindset of surviving. It was figuring out how to be us and to continue living out our mission and continue living out our beliefs and values and protecting our culture, even as things around us were shifting and changing. Our community came together. And I think part of the reason we were able to be so resilient is that we never separated. So when I talk about our community, I mean the residents who live here, I mean the staff who work here, I mean the board members who help govern us, and I mean the families and friends of every single one of those groups who are um, by virtue part of our community as well. And it was all of those people that helped source PPE and make PPE for us at the beginning. They were people who were feeding us information. And it was those same groups who received daily communication from us about where we were, what we knew, what we didn't know, what we were going to do about it. And then those folks were able to share, you know, their thoughts and questions and concerns. And so I think our resiliency over the last year really stems from the fact that we were always in it together and we stayed close. Today, we're in a much different place. Um, I mean, I guess who knows what the future will ever hold, but what it looks like today is very, very optimistic. We're opening up as is the city around us. We have dining happening in person in our fine dining area and our casual dining area. We have gatherings, we have guest suites open, we have visitors coming through on a regular basis. 
um, in safe ways, all of these activities are happening and there's a sense of new life. I think the spring weather is helping, but there's a sense of new life around here and a lot of enthusiasm by the members of this community to come back together. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a good and exciting time around here. Um, and why I think, you know, maybe we are where we are is that, again, we stayed close. Um, we were never really surviving something. We were always looking for ways to grow and grow together out of whatever our current circumstances would be. I think we were also aided by the fact that we found a nice balance as it relates to, to um, COVID and safety, found a nice balance between a conservative approach, always geared toward the safety and well-being of each person and the community as a whole, that balance again against creativity and tenacity, not just in the staff, but in all who live and work and are associated with this community. And so that sits on top of, I think, what an everyday experience of the Admiral might be, which is a strong community of people who are well connected, who are invested and engaged and who are together living lives of you know full authentic sense of purpose. And, um, and the folks here, um, before they even walk in the door, uh, tend to be very interesting people already. So all of that put together sort of multiplies. Um, so that's a little bit about us. I'm afraid to look at my timer and I apologize because I have a sense in my stomach that it was more than five minutes. Um, there's more we could talk about, but I, I thank you for letting me be here and Katie, thank you for letting thanks, me Thanks, Nadia, that, that's wonderful. I, it really is amazing when we look back and you'd mentioned a, a few words around that to my mind comes to the point about communications and just how strong the communications were over the past year, both um, internally with staff as well as with residents and with the community. And um, it just felt like there was really an openness and a strength in how we were talking with each other and working together. Um, so it, it really brought us to where we are today to be even stronger. So thank you. And thank you for your leadership in the past year. It's, um, it's, it's definitely feels like we are coming into the spring season and feels um, feels beautiful. It's, it's been a good, it's been a good spring. So this is also a great segue for Dr. Eric Mizuno, our medical director. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Mizuno. We appreciate you being here. Um, if you could give us a little bit of details about yourself and, and how it, and also, you know, that key talking point around um, safely moving forward together. Well, thank you for, for having me. Um, I'm uh, born and raised in Chicago. Um, I'm like Nadia, I was not the valedictorian of my kindergarten class, not even close, but I survived the Chicago public school system and um, eventually matriculated and did my internship residency at uh, Northwestern where I remained on faculty and staff until about a year ago. So we did about 30 years of service there. Um, I, after, I was part of a four member group there and we grew our practice to about a hundred physicians and uh, had over a quarter million patients in our practice and God came me in itch and urge to serve what I, what I perceived to be, to be perhaps the less served community. And I moved my practice to the inner city and through that I just, I discovered skilled nursing care in the nursing home setting. Um, in the midst of this, I flew myself to Haiti a week after the earthquake on a one-way ticket, had no way back to serve people um, in earthquake riddled uh, Haiti. I uh, kind of stole a jet to get to um, Puerto Rico two weeks after Maria uh, to get to a city that did not get a, a single airplane land in their area that was far from um, the capital San Juan. I landed myself in uh, New Orleans about 36 hours after the city had flooded with a plastic bag with a a t-shirt and a stethoscope telling them that I was a doctor who had no right to practice in the state of Louisiana, but I wanted to serve. And so this um, led me uh, to Dr. Perlmutter, who I consider to be the medical director emeritus of the Admiral, who was there from the, for, for, for many decades and was one of my mentors in Northwestern. Um, and I landed in this magical place of incredible people and a lot of cliches, you know, it's the sum of the parts and one thing um, that has shaped all of us, of course, with COVID was um, a lot of directive 
that wasn't guided by a lot of science. We were all learning with huge volumes of data and talking heads. And, you know, it's on the news once in a while about how do we take our environment and um, Nada remembers, I, I wrote a love letter to the Admiral. And I was astounded, this number is still to this day, I still, I can't get my arms around this. And it still makes me emotional that I was looking at all the skilled nursing facilities and nursing homes in Illinois. This is public information, you can verify this for yourself. That um, this is maybe in the mid spring and we can all, there's keynotes in our life and the last year is full of, you know, bad ones, but within them, there's like amazing things you discover. And at the time, um, I was looking at buildings of similar size, just as a kind of a, a ruler for myself and um, our efforts and buildings of uh, around our similar size and a bit by location. There's always apples and oranges. You know, we had, a, they had 150 to 190 cases, 150 cases, kind of scattered around the, the triple digit number. And I looked at our number and I think it was sitting, Nadia, you might help me recall, maybe four. And I thought, and I knew kind of where we were running, we we're keeping track of it. But it didn't, the number was so outlandishly off that I thought this can't be right. And I poured through the numbers again, I went to the state data again, and I realized something. And I, it prompted me to write this love letter to the Admiral that, you know, when I first met you, I think it was dear Admiral to Lake, when I first met you, I fell in love with you and who wouldn't, you're beautiful. <laughs> Just gorgeous from you know the out the, the outside looking in, but in the last month or two, I really fell in love with you because what this told me we were like two to three months into this process when things were blowing up exponentially. That um, this literally meant that every single person, and with the leadership of Nadia and uh, our incredibly gifted healthcare administrator, Mark Kubovic, and an incredibly gifted director of nursing, Angela Jello, that this message was crafted that please, and like, you know, Fauci says, I'm not sure how to explain to you that you should really care about other people. We live in communities of different, that are determined by demographics or different groups that we hang out with. And the message was pretty clear, you know, on the news about wearing your mask and trying to limit you have a liberty to do what you want. We have that we have that right in America, but we're asking you to give up personal needs and desires for the greater good. And all we can do is ask. It's not mandated, it's not illegal. And if like a few people deviate from this, it's, just, it's simply a request. It's a morally based request that if a few people don't, a few people don't abide by it, then the, the, sort of the whole point, it becomes pointless to the group. And the only way we got these numbers when you realize that like everyone, like nearly everyone, and this goes to the residents, um, to our beloved staff, like everyone got this message and they were adhering to it, you know, mainly for their own personal reasons, but also a sense of community. And these numbers have continued to persist that we're still running like at 10 to 15% of the numbers that other facilities have. And if you, so if you boil to me a single number, that's, that, that tells me volumes about the character of the people that um, we're with and that they're truly duty bound, but they're really devoted to this idea of community and just responsibility. You know, I'm, I, um, I track spiritually, I'm Christian, and so the Quaker background um, of the facility and, and more of the, um, this, the ideas that, that spirituality represents. To me, that single number was just astounding. And as you track that number now, what, eight, eight, nine months later, they continue to excel when you look at other facilities of our size and similar makeup. So um, that's what I have to say about the community that I work within. And I'm certainly a better person. And the real, the, the nitty gritty of the day to day is, um, are the people that are there every day. And for me on the healthcare side, that's Mark Kubovic. And I wish you were here and Angel Jello. I mean, I, it's uh, incredible the, the job that they do, that they're available 24 seven for our residents and their families. And uh, it's a privilege to even be able to share these stories with anyone who's considering um, a CCRC. And, you know, it has to be a good fit. So, you know, come by and take a look, but um, the fabric is not the beautiful building system, it's not. 
you can build a beautiful building. It's the people, it's the soul, it's the hurt. Um, our activities director, the, our social workers, we, in our back meetings, we always talk about this challenge of this teeter-totter of if, if you get more freedom, you know, you're, you're giving up safety. And we constantly talk about, well, how do we, how do we have our cake and eat it too? What do we design so that isolation means safety in terms of viral spread, but within this, there's still the ability to socialize. And we, we have to follow city, state, and federal guidelines, and we'll always do that. But within that, there's this constant undertone of conversation about we, we can't ignore the social needs, the emotional needs of our, of what we consider, you know, family members that, that reside here. And it's our responsibility and it's our devotion to them to keep them as healthy as possible and holistically, not physically only, but emotionally and spiritually when that comes into play. But it's that holistic health that I think, and it starts, it does start at the top. It's, um, it's a leadership thing. And that message gets permeated in every little thing, every message, the approach, the protocols, the policies are put together. And I think, you know, I can cast, confidently say that leadership does make it matter because they fashion that message based on some sort of mission statement that's in their head. That's not just on a corporate logo. It's really how they think and what they value, you know? And so I think um, to me, the leadership that um, I work with, they're all of that sort of, they're cut from that same fabric. So, but I thank you for the opportunity to, to be here today. Thank you. Can I just say one thing? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just the they, Dr. Mizuno. I mean, we don't need to go down memory lane too far. Um, but I think it's just important to say that there were many times as all of us together as a country, as a world, we're trying to figure out everything we didn't know. And there were many times that we were looking to Dr. Mizuno, who not, doesn't sleep, by the way, and somehow can read hundreds of pages of research data and this and that and studies. And he'd read it and he'd summarize it and he would help us figure out the best way forward based on the information we had at the moment. So Dr. Mizuno, when you talk about they as leaders leading the organization through this, you are part of the they. So uh, I just want to call it out in times where you were you. Um, extra available to us when we needed you most always. So thank you for that and your leadership. Thank you. I just think that it really is telling when your um, medical director starts with a love letter where he really where your leadership comes from so dr mizuno um your leadership throughout this past year your thoughtfulness your caring your um teamwork has just been amazing um really, the point so. of that is it didn't really matter what i did and I am, I'm a, a bit of a geek. And I, I, when I'm bored, I watch medical lecture videos and whatnot. Um, I'm deeply embedded in medical education. But um, the point is, had not every, like, like, it's just astounding. Like every resident and every staff member, it didn't matter how much hard work and elbow grease we put into it at the top. It, it wouldn't matter. It's like the community here, it's not something you can reproduce. It's, it's just, you know, when you, you buy a house, it's like you look at camps and you look at the building, how's the plumbing, you never really know what you're, 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 you're moving into until you meet your neighbors. And then you find out this beautiful house is like the worst house you could have moved into. And that's, that singular statistic tells, it just tells volumes about what people here are made out of. They truly care about each other. They have a sense of social responsibility and they care about um, each other to the extent that the many things that all of us have given up, like as a community, everyone gave up like everything for like a year. It's astounding, you know? And this is a highly sociable group. They, <laughs> they, like to, they like to get together. They like to socialize. They like to be very socially active things. And they were willing to just put that to the side for the unknown future. And everyone knew was, well, you're, you're talking like, go to your bedroom. Hey kid, go to your bedroom. For how long? I don't know. We'll talk about it in a year when you'll be not grounded anymore. And they're like, that's fine, you know? If I can do that for the community, that's what I'll do. So but thank you for the, the comments. Thank you very much. So that was uh, really wonderful. Thank you for sharing. So and now we're going to get the resident perspective as well. Minna Taylor is a resident here um, at the Admiral at the Lake, and she's also president of our resident council. So thank you very much, Minna, for sharing your thoughts today. I'll turn it over to you for um, some comments. 
Okay, well, I'm a lawyer, but I will try to limit the amount that I talk. Um, it's really bad to give a lawyer a microphone. I'm a former lawyer because I'm retired. Um, anyway, um, the, the, my background is from California. In case anybody's interested, it's in Marin County. It's a place that pre-COVID I went to and I hope to after COVID return to. Um, it's a place called Spirit Rock where I used to go for meditation retreats. And I like having it because it makes me feel common. Yeah. Um, <laughs> any, anyway, I, um, I lived with my husband in California for about 40, more than 40 years. And I, most of the time I lived in Los Angeles. So you might ask, why in the world would anybody leave Los Angeles to come to Chile, uh, uh, Chicago? And that's a very good question because I know most people go the other way. Um, but my daughter refused to come back to LA ever. And uh, so then there was only one option when my husband and I retired, which was to come to where she was. So Chicago was where she was. and. My husband, in addition, has a lot of family in and around uh, Wisconsin and Chicago. So this seemed like a good choice. Um, and so off we went. Now, of course, we didn't know anything about Chicago, and I still only know a small amount. Um, but we, we checked. We wanted to come to a CCRC because we had seen two of our really good friends um, within 24 hours of our seeing them, they had both had strokes. One was, he lost um, feeling on one side of his body. The other person kind of lucked out and didn't have much. Apparently his blood vessels were so, con so filled with cholesterol that it couldn't get to his brain. <laughs> so he, he managed to survive quite well. Um, so we, we looked around, I did a lot of internet searching. Um, um, one of the places that we looked at was the Admiral. I read all the reviews. I looked at all the employee reviews. I looked at a whole bunch of things and it seemed like basically a good place. And so we came here for a visit, which we used to be able to do. I maybe can still do. We can. <laughs> Okay, um, we spent a few days here. Um, after, after that visit, I knew this was the place I wanted to live. Um, we met a lot of people. We talked to a lot of people and they all, turned, they all seemed to be smart, very accomplished, very friendly and outgoing. Um, the place was beautiful. The people were, you know, the staff and the administration, everybody was really nice. And I, I remember saying to my husband at the end of that visit, you know, I could live here. And he said, so could I. So that made it pretty easy. Then of course was the problem of getting an apartment and moving and th that's a big pain in the neck. I'll warn you. <laughs> um, so we've been here now about two and a half years. And of course, and one of those years was basically COVID. So I'm not sure that it's exactly right, but I would say that this place is so different from any other place that I lived. This place is truly a community. We help each other, we care about each other, we go out of our way to help to be with each other. You know, if, um, and in COVID too, that sense of community, of caring for each other came through all over. Um, I know both Dr. Mizuno and Nadia have talked about it, but it was there. They kept the staff on, even though, they didn't have the, the kitchen, even though the dining room wasn't open, even though you know a lot of things weren't open, even the, when we couldn't get cleaning service, they kept the staff on who they gave other jobs to, one of which was like checking our temperature every day. Um, they did not really restrict 
what we could do. In the beginning, they served food to your rooms. You couldn't go to any of the dining rooms or any of the places to buy food. But if you wanted to go for a walk outside, that was your business, you could do it. They wanted you to wear masks. Um, pretty much, I think everybody wore masks um, voluntarily and those that didn't, you could just say, could you put on your mask or could you, you know, it was, it was really, really a community. And the Residents Association, along with the administration and the staff, we tried to find many ways to help those who would be lonely because they lived in a single apartment. Nobody was really locked in their apartment, but you know, ways to create tele, you know, telephone, internet, Zoom services, um, extra television programs. We ran our um, Find, found people to do speaker through the television. We just tried to make a lot of activities. Um, and many of them in the very beginning, particularly when nobody knew what was going on, were things like we made PPP, PPE things. We had a whole place upstairs in one of the gathering rooms where you could go and sew um, PPE. People made masks. Um, and then as we came to know more about COVID and what was the real problems with it, you know, we could open up a little bit. Um, and of course the, you know, COVID's gone up and down and hopefully we're not on our fourth wave. Um, but as we could open up more, we've done more social, social things. Um, you know, a few people can meet now in person. You can go in, um, to each other's apartments. They were fantastic on getting us vaccines. None of this calling around to like find out when and if you could ever get it. Um, so it was all kind of, oh, okay, my appointment is at one o'clock on Thursday. Um, you walk in, they take a little bit of information that I suppose was required. Somebody gives you a shot and they wanted to make sure you didn't faint afterwards. And so they kept you for 15 minutes and then they send you back to your apartment. So almost everybody here is vaccinated. And we did that twice. And it was kind of fun. It was a social event because you have to talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and yes. Can you highlight a little bit about your experience of you know, beyond COVID, kind of what your experience is as far as living in a living here at the Admiral. Oh, um, living, people living, who, you know. Living here in the Admiral pre-COVID was really fun. I mean, they, as soon as I moved in, they set you up with a buddy. So they would invite, they invite you to dinner at the, the nice dinner place. And then they managed to introduce you to everybody in the dining room. Now you don't remember everybody's name on that first, at first go round, but they all remember yours. <laughs> so all of a sudden you have 300 new friends uh, who, all, who all invite you everywhere. Um, 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 so I became a part of the residence council. Um, I really, I, they gave me a book that had people's biographies in them and I would dog leaf them. Once I met somebody, I would dog leaf it so I could maybe find them again. Um, I belonged to something called the breakfast club where we went down at 7.30 in the morning and we would talk and there was a woman who also sat there, but she was very deaf. So she didn't want to sit at our table, but she said, I love to hear everybody laugh because in the morning at 7.30, I don't know what we said. We didn't say anything profound, but we would just laugh and it was a wonderful day, way to start the day. That's dynamite. So it sounds uh, like you really jumped right into to activities and the socialization. I think we see, um, you know, the whole spectrum of people. Some people are coming for the full community experience and other people, you know, are a little bit more private. Um, yes. 
So, but thank you, Minna, for sharing your um, resident experience and some of those details. Thank you. We do have a few questions that uh, we want to pose to the panel and to manage this, I'll direct the question to the panelists. Um, and, but if, feel free if you're um, not at the headline, if you have something to add, please let us know. Um, so I think the first one um, is for Nadia. Um, are things back to normal and what does the resident, uh, what does the community look like now now that people are vaccinated? That's a great question. And thank you to the person who wrote it because I was thinking about this as Minna, as you were um, sharing the last little bit that you shared about sort of pre-COVID, here's what it looked like pre-COVID. And the thought that was creeping up in my mind as we were thinking about pre-COVID reality is how, how much we get to decide about what post-COVID reality looks like. And we're human beings, we seek you know, comfort and familiar things. And so we will automatically go back to the activities and the ways of being which are comfortable and familiar to us. But what is different about us now versus where we sat a year ago was all the, all the perceived and sometimes real, obviously, obstacles and challenges drove creativity and drove some innovative thinking about how we connect. Min alluded to some of it, you know, things that were happening by Zoom rather than in person and small groups coming together and meeting several times instead of having large groups come together. All that stuff that happened to us in our experience over the last year forced us to a totally different place in terms of expanding horizons around what could be. So now that we're reopened, we are settling back into those behaviors and activities and groups and meetings and things that are comfortable and familiar, which offer value. But we don't forget what we learned in the last year about expanding options and about sort of different ways of approaching things. And so we get to sort of create a new normal and we get to do that together. I'll give you an example. It's a simple one, but I think it's easy to, easy to share. Um, Pre-COVID, our catering um, program was geared more toward volume. So large group events and you know, different kinds of offerings for large gatherings. Well, COVID changed that a bit. And so um, somewhere in the middle of the last year, we started reworking the catering program. And the result of that is we've built in things like the concept of blue apron, you know, meal kits. We've built in that concept of blue apron meal kits. And we've had special meals that could be purchased around holidays that have happened. And you can purchase, you know, for two people, four people, six people. You can order two boxes for six and host 12. So these are simple examples. But when we come out, as we are coming out of COVID, and in many ways we have stepped out of COVID, we don't get rid of the catering offering that, that cares about big groups. We just add to it sort of this new approach to catering, which might happen in the unit and might be a smaller group of people. It might happen in the common area and be a medium sized group of people. It might happen in the waterfront and be a large group. We can now we can do it all. And this is just one very simple example of the ways I think that- It also makes me think of fitness classes where yeah. you know, it was you would go to the fitness studio and do a fitness class. And during COVID, we broadcast those over our television stations so everybody could get it in their residence. Um, well, we'll continue to do both now. I mean, they'll have that opportunity as well as now they're recorded. So there's many ways to access fitness that even prior to COVID we didn't have, so. And ironically, um, in terms of that example, Katie, because that's a great one, what we saw was that we were, the participation in fitness classes was exponentially higher when we broadcast the units. Why is that? For some people, it made a difference to be able to um, sort of roll out of bed to a workout and not have to feel like you had to be wearing a certain kind of thing. For some people, they liked the privacy during the workout. If they were struggling or needed to take a break, it was a little, you know, it was a little more private. Right. Um, the, the recordings, having that available on demand. So, so we'll offer both because some people like the in-person and some people like it at home, but the net gain is that now we have more people involved in fitness 
than we ever would have had if it hadn't have been for the challenges of the last year. And that's just a second example of right. Hundreds, we have been hundreds the, probably. Yeah. yeah. I do have another question. Um, there's there's lots we could share about our resident experience, but I do. This is a specific question for Dr. Mizuno. Um, so it's around vaccinations. What will be, uh, what do you, what will we be required? The question is, will you make it mandatory for residents and staff to get the vaccine? And are you seeing any long-term effects? And I don't think this is just for our community. I think they mean, are you, what's the medical community seeing as far as long-term effects for people who've had COVID? So this is a personal um, confession. Um, in, in, in not to be political, but um, when the vaccine, I you know I'm a doctor, but I'm a human being. Um, hopefully, a human being first, actually. But and for good reason, the fastest vaccine that was um, brought to market in the history of the FDA was the measles vaccine. That took four years for development. And so, when you push a vaccine to one year, and for under, it doesn't matter the reason why. The, the reasons were compelling, but certain things you can't make a cake in a minute. You just things take a while, and so if I were to be totally honest, I I was sort of the mind I'm going to wait to get the vaccine until not that other people should be the guinea pigs, but just that the scientific process, which can't be made more quickly, certain things just need to take a while. So I spent two days just pouring through all the studies that were done. I reviewed all the FDA processes on vaccination approval, and I discovered, and we should make our decisions uh, based on information, that there was not a single step that was skipped in the process or truncated, except for one. And that is that typically a vaccine should be allowed to settle in and the study participates for six months before approval would be considered. For exponential sped reasons, I totally don't disagree with the FDA reason to give an emergency approval to at least make it available for those who wanted to have access to it. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at all vaccines, virtually every side effect that occurs in the vaccine occurs in the first four weeks after, after it's given. And we were well beyond that at this point in time. And vaccine trials require about two to 3,000 to have a, what we call an N um, to be a, a large enough number to prove something. These were given to a logarithmically larger number, 30,000, 50,000 people. And so I felt very solid. And I also thought, well, morally, how can I expect people in the person to get a vaccine if I weren't willing to get it myself? It's an issue of leadership, but also I'm not foolish. I'm not gonna put something into my own body that I'm not convinced about. But I became solidly convinced that this is the right thing to do. The way the FDA works, if it's an emergency approval, which is not full approval, it is illegal to mandate a vaccine. Uh, an employer can't require something that is not thoroughly officially approved yet. Um, nor was that the, the culture of the Admiral in the first place it would never require somebody. It's still a choice you can make. And so um, it can't be mandated. Um, it's, it's not possible to do that. Uh, one thing I can probably say that Everyone is aware of the numbers that, I mean, uh, in some cases, 40, sometimes 50% of people are not planning or they're still leery about the vaccine. I think it's a testament to the level of understanding of the importance of this, this vaccine that um, our vaccination rates are nearly 100%. I mean, you can't get herd immunity in a larger population or a micro population unless enough people that are gonna start milling about are fully vaccinated, then we're reaching those numbers. So um, I'll defer to, to um, Nadia about what, what the Admiral protocol is, but I know that on a national basis, you cannot require something that's under what we call EUA approval. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mizuno. I think my answer is very similar to yours. Um, you know, at this point, we are not mandating it. Um, we have almost all of the residents have received their vaccine, literally almost all. There were a few who couldn't. Um, there were some who weren't in the building, you know, in, in second homes or something like that. Uh, but for the most part, almost everybody that was here received it. 
We are also making sure we stick close to Chicago Department of Public Health. We, we've become best friends with them over the last year. And so through them, through Walgreens, which had been our um, provider for the first three vaccine clinics, Joel Osco now has come back to recently to offer a fourth clinic. Um, we're, we're sticking close and making it available to anybody who's new to our community, new to staff, um, who are interested in receiving their first or second or both doses. And that's our stance, um, you know, and, and for a variety of reasons, I think based on what we know about the vaccine now, we do understand it to be a personal decision about what the individual wishes for themselves should they become exposed to and contract the virus. Um, and so that, that, is, that is our stance. Um, what we have done is the Admiral up to and during and in the aftermath of our vaccine clinics, what we've wanted to do all along is to help people make informed decisions, not decisions out of fear or the absence of information, but informed decisions about what is in their best interest and encouraging them to think about that for themselves and to seek input from their primary care physician if they have questions. And that's been for us the most successful strategy. Thank you, that, that's, that's wonderful. And um, as a staff member here, the information um, shared was, was on point and it was actually quite a celebration that we had on our vaccination days. So I think everybody was just thrilled to have the access early in the process for the community, you know, for our community within the larger Chicagoland community. Um, it was it was wonderful. So I think this one's for you. I have the next question is for you, Minna. Um, so are you seeing um, more more people traveling and dining out or people out and about in the community more? What does it feel like? It definitely feels like there's a lot more people out in the community, a lot of people dining out. I guess next this week is Chicago Restaurant Week. Um, so I know several people who are going to take advantage of that. I think people now feel much freer, um, both to go to do outside activities and to meet in groups within the Admiral. So our gathering room can hold 24 people. It's not a lot of people given that we have 300 residents or so in independent living, but you can do that. You can have people to your apartment and have dinner. I've done that several times. Um, I'm very much looking forward to when my daughter gets her two vaccines, her second vaccine because then she can come and visit and I can go visit her and she won't be all upset. And we don't have to live our lives outdoors. We can do things indoors. So yes, we're, we're really seeing a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot more freedom generally. I still haven't taken a bus though. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is referring to uh, one of the things that oftentimes gets brought up is, you know, access to downtown and we're on the 147 bus line. So we're just a quick 15 minute bus ride to downtown. Um, so there are a few more questions and I think a number of these are still for Minna. Um, so you mentioned the difficulty of, of moving. <laughs> But do you have any advice for someone who is um, going to be moving into the Admiral of the Lake? As someone who's been through it. Oh, well, um, yes. I would suggest that you um, go through your home. I went through mine with two bags in my hand, garbage bags. Every I did this for a couple of, a couple, a couple more, well, maybe a couple months. Um, I didn't do it all at once. Um, one bag was for junk, which was going to go into the trash. And the other was for anything that I could get rid of that I didn't care, but could go to a, a charity. So every day I would like tackle another closet or a cabinet or something. I even had to tackle my daughter's room because she had moved out and for example, I found like five years of Cosmopolitan magazines. <laughs> um, but but that was that's the basic thing. Um, if you can get somebody to professionally move you, 
do it. If you can afford it, do it. It's so much easier. Well, that's like you um, threw me a softball right there because we actually have a move-in special that we're offering people that includes um, a moving expert, a downsizing expert. So um, thank you for setting that one up. <laughs> <laughs> so no, we have some, we do provide quite a bit of step-by-step um, -step assistance for people who are going through the moving process, um, all the way from picking out the apartment and the selections to working with experts during the move-in. Um, okay, but let's see, one last question. Um, so are there, what are the current um, re restrictions or lack, you know, what is the current status of independent living versus um, the harbors for um, moving safely in today's, um, at today at the Admiral? I think I'll give that to Nadia. Yes, I think that's a good idea. Okay, well, I was gonna defer it to you, Minna, but okay. Well, so, well, and the question is about moving, Katie, or just being here? You no, know, being here. What's it look like? You know, like? I think people want to know, we've talked a lot about the different stages that we've had um, following Chicago guidelines and the state yeah. of Illinois guidelines. And so currently today, what what is that? So, yeah, and that's a good, the, the disclaimer on what I'm about to say is this reflects where we're at today and things change and the trend is good. They're changing in, you know, ever better ways one day or one week to the next. So today where we stand is that we are more or less open. It, it's just that these days folks are wearing masks when a year ago that wasn't part of something that any of us were doing on a regular basis. We've got people gathering. Minna mentioned that the gathering room, which has capacity for 100 people or so, um, you know, is down to about 24. The reason for that is we are, as we're gathering, making sure that we are maintaining, you know, proper social distancing between individuals, especially those who don't share a household. And so if you went into the gathering room, you would see people fairly spaced out and wearing masks, but they're gathered and we're gathered together for meetings and performances and you know exercise classes and all that kind of stuff. So all the normal things are back. If you walked into the bistro right now, um, for us, if you're not in central time zone, it's getting to be about lunchtime. If we walked into the bistro together right now, you would see people gathered around tables, masked down because they're eating. Um, but around tables, talking and laughing um, and, and dining together. And that happens, you know, in both our casual bistro as well as our fine dining, waterfront dining room. Um, so that dining's back to normal, you know, and has been for, for a while now. Um, you know, in terms of gathering in each other's units, that's been happening. Visitors have been welcomed for uh, so many months now. I, I can't even tell you you know, how long it's been. Um, so in, in a lot of ways, it's normal. I think, I think the difference is that we're just doing it in masks. And there are some considerations given to the number of people gathered in a particular space. But, but Minna, I think you hit on this earlier, and I meant to say something somewhere along the way, if the door opened, here it is. You know, there, there weren't, as far as the Admiral's concerned, there weren't a lot of extra rules in place. So I, I have friends who work in the field who are really good at what they do. They come from great communities um, and they, you know, they had restrictions in place. If you as an independent living resident leave this community, even if it's just to get in your own car and drive around town, when you come back, you'll be in a two week quarantine, no exceptions. We didn't do that. And we didn't need to because of what Dr. Mizuno shared about, you know, a conscious group of people socially, you know, concerned with being a good member of society. Well, they were concerned about being good members of the community too. So we didn't do that. We said, hey, if you're going out for that walk that Minna referenced, if you're going out for that walk, here's how to do it safely based on what we know today. Wear a mask, stay six feet away, hand sanitize on your way out. And when you come back, don't be around other people if you don't feel well or they don't feel well. Here's what to do if that happens. You know, hey, we'd suggest you don't ride in cars with people who aren't from your unit, but if you're gonna do that, here's how to do it. We'd suggest you don't go visit your family outside of the community, but if you're gonna do that, here's how you do it. And this stuff that I'm sharing with you is now nine months ago. I mean, this was all at the beginning 
of COVID. And these days, I think our language is still the same. Here's what we know. Here's what seems safe and prudent if we are to be responsible to one another and to keep each other safe. Um, and if you're gonna have gatherings, here's a way to do it. Here are some considerations for how to do it safely. And, and most of the time residents are coming to me saying, um, what do you think about four people coming over for dinner? And it's like, well, sounds fun. Can I be the fifth? You know, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be there, I'll bring the wine, you know, let's do it. Um, and, and I think there, there's a lot of, of care that's been put in by everybody. And that makes all the difference. So that allows us to say, we're open, we're open. We're just in masks, but we're mm -hmm. open. Yeah. Um, yes, we're open. <laughs> that's what it feels like. It, it, and, and the breakfast club is back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just perfect. Thank you so much. I wanna thank the panelists for sharing your thoughts and your insights. This was wonderful um, and it, I think, really tells a beautiful story about the Admiral at the Lake, not just the building, but for sure the people who are here. Um, and thank you so much for um, being with us. And for the people who jumped on to our Zoom, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we do have quite a bit of information online or uh, our available apartments. We have drone tours available online. But of course, feel, feel, feel free to reach out and contact our Residency Counselor Kelly and I are here to assist in any way. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us today and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank, thank you so you much. everyone. <laughs>